The Dr. Taz Show. The podcast, Dr. Taz. Superwoman Wellness. Here's Dr. Taz. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Superwoman Wellness, where you know I'm determined to bring you back to your superpower self. Joining me today on a very important topic is Claire Bidwell Smith. She's an internationally renowned author, speaker, and grief expert. She's the author of three books of nonfiction, The Rules of Inheritance, After This, When Life is Over, Where Do We, where do we Go?, and Anxiety, The Missing Stage of Grief. Claire comes to this work from a very personal place. By the time she was 25, she had lost her mother and her father to cancer. She was their only child and had her adolescence shaped by their diagnoses, their treatments, and then their deaths. After they were gone, Claire was left feeling very alone in the world, consumed with anxiety and depression. Years later, she now understands that what she experienced was normal. Welcome to the show, Claire. Thank you so much. So a heavy topic, but given the landscape of today, a really important topic, I first want to say I'm so sorry for your losses, but like all losses, it sounds like you have moved through them and tried to build something from them. Maybe talk to us about the sensation of grief and what that does to us physically, and then we can go into some of the amazing work you've been doing since. And remember, we're talking at a time where We've emerged from, I don't even know that we've emerged, but we have experienced a pandemic, a global pandemic that none of us have seen in our time and have walked right into the race wars and the protest and all the issues over over uh, George Floyd's death. So it's a really tough time, I think, I would say in the country, but I think it's really global at this point. So talk to us about your experience with grief and then maybe bridge it over to what the collective is going through right now. Sure. Um, it is a, a astounding time in our in our country, in our world, um, culturally. And I think that grief is such a huge part of all of it. And I think that often um, grief is an aspect that's a little overlooked just because we think it always has to apply to the loss of a person, of a loved one. Um, but grief can be about the loss of our health, the loss of our job, the loss of our dignity and respect mm-hmm. and control and health administrations and political administrations and racial disparity, we can have grief over all of these things. And I think that um, we dismiss it so often that we don't even realize the physical symptoms of it. Um, and one of the things that manifests with grief is, is anxiety, um, mm-hmm. is anger, um, is deep depression. And so we may be feeling some of those things and not even really quite realizing where they come from, where they're stemming, what to do with them, how to move through them. Um, But I think that when we allow ourselves to recognize grief as it is and what it is, then we can move through it in ways that are really productive and can kind of help us rebuild, help us reorganize ourselves, um, help us kind of figure out where it is we need to change and grow. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But here's what I've noticed. Now, in your case, there was a very, it was very obvious, right? You lost your parents and it sounds like you had a long road. Um, I'm curious, what did grief feel like for you? Were you someone that withdrew? Did you cry a lot? What was the physicality of your grief? Yeah, I have never been, um, and uh, like very uh, attracted to anger. So for me, I've always been very sad. <laughs> like that's mm-hmm. kind of where I'm at. And so it's been a lot of crying, some depression, and then a fair amount of anxiety mixed in there. Um, Losing both of my parents to cancer made me very fearful of my body. So it took yes. me a really long time to come around to being able to be present to my body. Um, I ran from it in every possible way. Mm. Um, and when I did start to come around to it, it was through yoga. And it was so painful initially to just sit in my body. Like as yoga was asking me to, you know, hold a stretch. It was the most present I had been to my body in years. Oh. Um, so often I would really just cry a lot through yoga because I had to actually sit there and feel my body. So amazing. I think that a lot of these emotions do disconnect you from your body. You end up living in a separate space and not understanding where the physical, the mental and the spiritual is. What I'm finding with what's going on right now is that people aren't necessarily calling it grief and they're not experiencing the physicality of it. So how they're feeling on a day-to-day business, if they're able to focus, if they're able to concentrate, you know, they're not so conscious of that. What would you tell anyone listening today? Like maybe your top three or four signs 
that what they're feeling or what they're experiencing, they can put that label on it. They can put that label of grief on it. How would they identify that? Because so many people can't, they can't even verbalize it, right? They're, it's, it's beyond even that. Yeah, I think it can look like um, either lethargy, like a real just heaviness and just weighted down depression and exhaustion, or it can be a kind of buzzy anxiety that I think Mm -hmm. happens. Um, Sleeplessness. um, I think that, you know, like you said, that trouble focusing and really kind of like just not being able to even remember what happened two minutes ago, I think is is often something I see. Mm. Um, Interesting. I think that people just think that there's something overall wrong with them. And really it's a lot of grief. It's a lot of anxiety. It's a lot of your soul, your mind, just trying to hold on to all of the stuff you're feeling. Wow. Cause I have met people that can't remember things and I, I don't think even I have connected it to grief necessarily, but that makes a lot of sense. Now grief, do you believe in the, I think isn't it the five stages of grief? Am I remembering that correctly? Do you believe in that? Some people say that that's a little outdated. What do you think of that? I think it's an evolving cross stage model. Um, I love Elizabeth Kubler Ross, mm-hmm. who's part of five stages of grief. She was a real kind of renegade and rebel in her field, and especially as a woman, kind of coming out in the 1960s against um, a lot of male doctors who mm-hmm. didn't want to recognize her at first. And she um, really worked hard to start to advocate for people who were dying and um, facing terminal diagnoses and were not being paid attention to by medical personnel. Mm. No one really cared what their experience was. They only cared about their symptoms, treating the symptoms. So the work she did was just, she pioneered this field. Um, And I think that the five stage model she came up with was really helpful to kind of get the conversation going and it's continued to unfold and we've added more stages to it. We've kind of expanded some of the stages that are there. The one tricky thing about the the five stages is that it got so popular that it's the first thing everyone thinks about. Right, right. I think people love the idea of there just being these five kind of steps like, oh, I just have to move through these five steps and then I'll be okay. And that's not really how it works. So Mm. we'll get a little tripped up there. Well, how does grief work and, and what, you know, is there a normal pathway to grief or is everybody through grief or is everyone's story different? And do you have sort of a, a roadmap when you're grieving, you know, of how to walk through it and where to maybe land at the end of that? I think grief looks different for everybody. Um, I think that our grief is as unique as the relationship we have with the person we lost. Mm. Um, Our grief is as unique as our personalities. Some people are very introverted. Some people are very extroverted. Some people are very in touch with their emotions or they're very emotional people. So grief is different. And I think um, people often feel a lot of shame, guilt, not sure how to how to be in their grief because they think it should look one way. Either they're crying all the time and they think they shouldn't be, or they're not crying at all. And they think they should be crying all the time. You know, Mm -hmm. one of the things I think people really get tripped up about is how long grief lasts. Grief lasts much longer than most people will give it credit for. So your community will often be like, after about three months, everyone shows up in the beginning and then about three months, then they all are like, okay, yeah. hope, you're, hope you're doing well now. Are you ready to like clean out that bedroom or that closet? Right. And you're just entering into it at that point. Huh. Wow. So what does someone do? You know, they're grieving. They've, you know, lost anything, their identity, their job. You know, it's interesting. And this is going to get us a little bit out there in left field, but I love it because I can bring it all together. But we do some vibrational energy scanning in our practice at Symmetry MD. And we match it, of course, to lab work. We don't ever diagnose off of it. But it will often identify some of these emotions. It'll say that there's grief or there's anger or there's, you know, anxiety or things like that. Um, And then I'm always struck with how do I build a toolbox for this person to walk through this emotion that they're experiencing? Mm -hmm. What do you typically recommend to people when they, okay, let's say they recognize it, they acknowledge they've got grief. Where do they go next? What is the best way forward for them? I think grief support is always really useful. I think that grieving can be such a lonely process and you can feel so isolated and like you're the only person going through this loss. Um, So finding ways to feel supported in that, whether it's meeting other people who have gone through the similar loss or grief support with a grief counselor or reading a book about loss. Um, I know that those are kind of bigger picture items, but I can't emphasize enough how healing it is to 
not feel alone and not feel like you're going crazy. Grief is this emotion that just this process where so many times people just think that they're going crazy and that there's something wrong with them. And so finding ways to kind of normalize the process of what you're experiencing. And by doing that, that means reading about it, talking to other people about it. Um, it takes this shame and secrecy away from it. Mm-hmm. It helps you sit with it because the the main thing to do with grief is to learn how to sit with it. Um, as Elizabeth Kubler Ross said, it's not going anywhere until it's had its way with you, essentially. Wow. What is uh, anticipatory grief? You made a comment about that. Or I see a comment about that. What is that? Um, that's the grief that we feel when we know we're going to experience a loss. Oh. We're going to continue experiencing a loss. It's most common experience when people um, are caring for a dying loved one. Mm. You know, so maybe they have six months before the person dies, and they they're leading up to that, knowing the whole time that this is going to be a loss they're going to go through. Um, but I think that you know we've experienced some of that in the pandemic, just right. knowing that this is still unfolding, not knowing how long it's going to go or how much more it's going to you know become. So we can experience anticipatory grief in that way too. And then your last book was, uh, the third book you just wrote was more on anxiety. Uh, what was the exact title? Anxiety, the mistaken, uh, the missing stage of grief. What is the connection between grief and anxiety? And then is it, is it necessarily anxiety in men and women, or is it anger in men and anxiety in women? Uh, what is that connection? That's interesting. Um, Yeah, I think we do see more anger in men and more anxiety Mm -hmm. in women, but I see a fair amount of anxiety in men as well. Mm -hmm. Um, They mask it more than women do. Women are more liable to talk about it. Men are more likely to conceal their anxiety and just not talk about it. Mm -hmm. Tricky emotion because you can hide it well. Um, Anger is a much more active, action-based, you know, explosive energy. Right. And underneath both of them is usually fear and sadness. If you peel up the lids of anger and anxiety, you will almost always find fear and sadness. Um, So you mentioned a couple of things. You mentioned uh, grief counselors, community, sitting with the emotion. What else can someone do when they're experiencing grief and they realize that their anxiety or their anger really stems from that? Are there other outlets? Are there other things that you've seen work? Things like journaling? Does meditation make a difference? Does consistent yoga practice make a difference? I'm just thinking very specifically, and I won't obviously name names of people very close to me who might be in this position and forgetting things, you know, where they never forgot things before, but have had a number of hits that would then induce grief and has now induced anxiety and maybe even anger. Like if I was giving them a prescription from you, what would that look like? I think journaling is a really great one. Um, I think people really underestimate that. Um, just sitting sitting down every morning and just putting a pen to paper or keyboard um, and writing out everything that's coming up for you. We hold so much that we don't even realize we're holding. So when we start writing, a lot comes out. But meditation is the single most useful tool in mm-hmm. society. It's always meditation. It's the wow. number thing that I recommend. Um, we have got to learn how to sit and be present and also learn how to not attach to all of the thoughts we have going on. When we're grieving and when we're anxious, we're often dwelling in the past, thoughts about the past, and we're often dwelling in thoughts about the future. And we are so very rarely in the present moment. And the present moment is really the only thing that exists, right? So if we're sitting there dwelling in the past and kind of rehashing things, or we're thinking about things that haven't even happened yet, um, we're creating more anxiety. Um, Bringing yourself to the present moment is so useful. And also just becoming aware of, of how your thoughts make you feel. Mm-hmm. You know, we wake up in the morning and we look at our phones before we're even out of bed. We scroll through for two minutes and the amount of information we download, just looking at the news, social media, right. our text messages can cause a massive reaction throughout our entire physical body, you know? Right. So being conscious about, about what you're taking in and what thoughts you're attaching to. How do we recognize, and a a couple things I want to make sure we get in, but how do we recognize grief in our children? How does that, like, you know, because children are trickier, right? They're not going to tell you that they're sad or upset, like this whole COVID pandemic. And I finally saw the grief on my children's faces when they couldn't be with their friends and they couldn't have their normal life, you know, but again, it takes a mother observing external clues and behavior to really pull that out of them. How do we know with our kids that they might be grieving? 
a few ways. Um, dreams, if they tell you about tell you about their dreams for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, anxiety, if they start getting anxious about anything, um, separation anxiety, you leaving, coming or going, worrying about other people. Um, and then play, you can always see it in their play if you just pay attention a little bit, you know, like I'll watch my daughter play with her dolls and she will play that like one of them gets sick or mm. um, somebody dies. And so you kind of see it there. I remember um, I was volunteering after Hurricane Katrina in Houston and it was all these refugees from New Orleans who were in this big um, conference center and the kids built, there was all these cardboard boxes around and they built all these really fun forts that they were playing in. Right. Uh-huh. All of a sudden they started destroying them and they were saying, I'm Katrina. And they were just knocking them down and ripping them to pieces as if they were kind of reenacting what had happened to their homes. Right. So you see it in, in those ways. And then with children too, how do you help them process free? Is it the same? Like, Hey, write about it. Let's talk about it. It's hard to get kids to meditate. What, what do we tell, what do we do with children? I think just helping them talk about it, um, really creating space. A lot of times we get so uncomfortable seeing our kids in pain that we try to push through really quickly. Like, let's not talk about that. Or we'll talk Mm -hmm. about it later. Rather than saying that, sitting down and being open, letting them ask questions. I think we get scared when kids ask questions we don't have the answers to. Like, why is this happening right now? Um, why Why is there a pandemic? Why are there, you know... Why is there police brutality? Why um, all these different things that we, when is school going back? Things that we don't know the answer to. Not being afraid to say, I don't know. Just allowing space and sometimes saying, I don't know. What do you think? You know, mm-hmm. helping them to feel comfortable talking. Yeah, I think too with the children, a lot of times it's our energy and, and they feed off of it, right? Like, so if we're anxious, they're anxious. And if they get anxious, we get anxious. So it's trying to break that like back and forth that happens with kids so much, you know, and as we've already mentioned a couple of times, we're middle in the middle of the pandemic, in the middle of these different, you know, race riots and wars and things like that. What does that do when it comes to grief? And for anyone experiencing this, maybe not within their home, but experiencing experiencing it maybe more collectively, mm-hmm. you know, how is that process? What would you tell any of us who are just really sad about what's happening around us and what's happening to the country and what's happening to our brothers and sisters. I mean, how would you, how do we process all of this? I just feel like it's, it's a lot, you know, do we come together? Do we take time alone? You know, do we form support groups? Do we protest? Like how, what is the best way for us to, to process a lot of the grief, which is translating into anxiety and then of course into anger that I think many people in this country are feeling today. Yeah, I think all of those things that you mentioned, I think we have to do all of them. I think we process alone. I think we come together in community support. I think we protest. I think we need to be writing about it, talking about it. I think really letting yourself have some private moments set aside an evening or an afternoon or a morning for yourself and just cry, like light a candle and let yourself feel all the sadness. There is so much sadness underneath all the anger and anxiety and sadness for so many good reasons. You know, let yourself grieve. I think sometimes people um, feel like they're not supposed to grieve someone else's loss or someone Mm -hmm. else's death, especially if it's someone they didn't know. Um, But it's okay to grieve that. It's okay to feel sadness around that. It really is. Goodness, such a topic for our times, for sure, with everything going on. If anyone wants to get a hold of your books, what's the best way for them to do that? And how can they get in touch with you as well? Um, You can find everything on my website, clairebidwellsmith.com. And the books are everywhere. Books are sold. Fantastic. Well, thank you for taking some time today to join me on this episode. I really appreciate it. I think it's such a, a timely topic with everything that we're all going through. Thank you for using your experience of grief to bring education and awareness to so many people. It's, it's a much needed thing. I see it just as a sidebar. I see grief in the exam room every day, I but I see it in a different way. People don't tell me that they're grieving. I see it in their numbers. I see it when I have to match together different forms of Eastern diagnoses with their Western diagnoses. And at the end of the day, what grief is doing to the body, to our physical body, it creates high inflammation numbers. It creates a cortisol surge. And that in turn becomes a precursor for so many different things. In fact, in Chinese medicine, they talk about how when a woman experiences deep grief 
oftentimes she stores that emotion in her liver. The liver gets very sluggish. And the first place that a woman's grief will often show is in her breast. And so mm -hmm. it always struck me as I was studying Chinese medicine of the connection between our emotions and then the diseases that we're seeing today. So an important topic, whether we're talking about the pandemic, whether we're talking about the protest and race wars, whether we're talking about diseases and illnesses or just really the health of our families, really important to recognize it, to be able to identify it and then to build a support box and toolbox around it. I'm dealing with this at different levels as well. So this has been personally helpful. Thank you so much for that. Well, thank you so much for the work you do and for having these conversations. Well, I love it and we will have you back. But for everybody else, thank you for watching this episode of Superwoman Wellness, where you know we're trying to bring you back to your superpower self. If you enjoyed this episode of the show, please rate and review it and share it with your friends. And remember, we are on Spotify as well. I'll see you guys next time.